Enemies of the Imperium tremble before the might of the war machine known as the Surastus Knight Lancer. This will soon come to you and destroy you utterly, crushing you with its mighty speed and incredible weaponry, such as its mighty shock lands. Oh, uh, it's drooped. Uh, someone get some tech priests, quickly! Did Matt Ward write the rules for this or something? Quick! Fans of Horus Heresy and having really strong lances, thank you very much for joining me. And I hope you enjoyed that humorous little introduction to today's how-to video. Gosh, well, before I get into this, it's been a long time since we've been down with the how-to video and um, sat with the map. So it's nice to make a return to it today. Now. As you've probably figured out from the intro, um, this video is going to be about strengthening the shock lance for the Serastus Knight Lancer model by Forgeworld. And in front of us, lo and behold, we have the parts for the lance of that kit. Um, this is a friend's model, and um, they recently picked it up. The Serastus Knight Lancer, it's the original Serastus Knight that Forgeworld did. It's a beautiful model. But it does have a flaw, and it's a very significant flaw. The lance haft, let's say this piece, uh, is not strong enough over time to support the weight of the lance head, particularly in the extended forward position. And as I showed in the introduction, you see lots of these knights um, with rather sad, droopy lances. So what I'm going to do in this video is I'm going to show you how to put a steel pin through this to strengthen it. and here we have this, and this is about, oh gosh, how thick is this wire? This is probably about one point, oh, something like 1.8 millimeters thick, maybe a bit more. Don't th it might even be two, 1.82 millimeters thick. But what I'm gonna show you in this video is how to drill these parts through to accept this steel rod, which it can then be assembled, and there'll be no chance of drooping occurring due to weight and heat over time. So that's the plan. So firstly just a quick run over the parts. There is the um, the main body of the lance and this faces forwards. Uh, that's forwards. Then we've got the head of a shock lance and then we've got the rear of a shock lance as well and then we've got the two uh, parts of a haft. Now this has been designed in such a way that you can either have the long end forward, like so, or, should you wish it, the parts reverse, and there you go, you can have a short end forward, and in that particular configuration it would then uh, look a bit like that. But what my friend wants is he wants um, he wants a long end forward, so you know, he wants the uh, he wants a lance extended as if it has just made a strike or about to make a strike. Now, as you can probably imagine, there's quite a lot of uh, drilling to do here. And in particular, this piece and this piece, it's like, well, how do you drill through that? What I'm going to show you is how you can do that with some quite simple tools. Some patience and, you know, let's be honest, you do need a bit of skill. But uh, what I'm hoping to demonstrate is it can be done. So, talking of tools, let's have a quick introduction to today's tools. Starting in the knife department, uh, we may need these a little bit. We've got a razor sharp craft knife and a blunt craft knife. My usual combo. We have the bradle spike. So useful for uh, making marker holes for starting to drill. Talking of drills, we have two pin vices. We have this pin vise, which has got about a uh, one millimeter drill in it, and this one, which has got a two millimeter drill in it. Well, that's actually a 2.1 millimeter drill. And the reason we've got two is this is to make a guide hole, and this is to make the final hole, and this is ever so slightly wider diameter than the reinforcement pin we are going to be using. Now, you probably see that the, neither of these is particularly long, and uh, the 2.1 millimeter drill is only about 70% of the length of the longest piece. But of course the trick here, also what I'm gonna show you, is by going in from opposite ends, 
you can use fairly normal, easily available drills uh, to do this without having to buy more exotic tools um, and long drills, which uh, bring problems of their own. So um, that's that's what I'm going to hope to demonstrate to you today. In case of any sanding or filing, we've got a needle file, flat underside, curved upper and tapering to a point. And then we've got a, hmm, what is this? A 1500 coarse grain FlexiPad a sanding stick. These are great. This one's a, I've had this, ooh, 18 months, two years now. 18 months, shall I say? Uh, yeah, maybe a bit less. It's seen a lot of use. It's a bit worn now, so I'll be replacing it soon, but these are absolutely great. And people who've watched my how-to videos before will be familiar with those. Right, in terms of cutting this wire, because it's a little bit long, we've got a set of hardened wire cutters. These are a little bit on the um, small side for the thickness of wire. However, they're still good enough, and I've already cut it, so it's, it's yeah, it works. So yeah, it works. Bits going around all over the place. And then finally, we've got Dusty Brush. So that's the plan. As usual, with one of these videos, I'm gonna talk about some topics that are on my mind as we work. Let's begin with some drilling. I guess the question is, where do you start? Well, let's start by looking at um, these pieces, and in particular these these here, and thinking about where we need to put the pin. If we look at these in end section, we can see how uh, you've got this form. So this is like a cylinder at the top, and you've got a narrow connection to the bottom. So the pin is going to need to run through this lower section, and that needs to be nicely centrally located and we can actually work aligned with uh, this peg here. So that's that's a useful start. So that is where I will run that through and I need to carry that through into that section as well. And likewise, the head and the uh, haft or, uh, well, the opposite end, I don't know quite what the technical term is for that, um, of the actual spearheads. So that's the plan. So, Let's start off, where should we start? Should we start small? Let's start small. We'll start with this one. All right, move those to, just move those to one side and then take our bradle spike. And the first thing to do is to just make a guide hole. All right, well, it's not a hole, a guide mark. And that is where we're going to start drilling into so it's not quite central. The good thing with resin though is you can easily reposition holes. That's nice, that's nice and central now. And then I'm going to put one in here as well. I haven't got the tab to guide me, so I'm just purely using my eye. And there you go, happy with that, nice and central. So now you'll recall we had two pin vices. We're going to start by doing a guide hole with this thinner one. Two reasons for that. Firstly, it's easier to do. Secondly, it gives us a little bit of room for correction later on. Rather than going straight in with the thicker drill, you could do that, but you'll find that going straight in at that thickness, um, it's just harder work to do. Some people might like to use motorized Dremel type drills here, uh, but I do like the handheld touch. Oh, wait a second, the cat's meowing. I'll be back in a moment. Right, the carnivorous quadrupedal mammal has been allowed back in the house. Right, where were we? Let's begin. So, I'm going to start by drilling a guide hole. Now, clearly you need to be pretty on target with this you haven't got much room for error. Just to show you that, um, that's the sort of diameter of the hole we're going to end up with once we've done this final bit. That's just a demo. We're, we're going to continue doing the guide hole with this. So the key thing is, it's it's just to take it easy and not to rush it. And as you start drilling in, is to continually just change, just check your orientation and make sure that you're going in true um, both in your, well, let's say, 
your vertical and your uh, horizontal axis. It's probably the right way of putting it, uh, which will probably be your. Um, if we talked about this in flight sim terms, what would that be? Your uh, your x and your z axis, wouldn't it? That's nice. Now I guess I could just go straight through here. Uh, and yeah, I think we, I think I will actually. Uh, there's no need to go from both ends on this one. So let's do that. What I will do is I'll edit this video down. I'm not. I probably won't show every bit, every single last bit of the drilling. So it's uh, going to take a while. Probably only so much drilling you can watch before you uh, get bored to tears of it. But for this bit, we will do the whole thing. Well, there you go. Change my mind straight away, and I'm now going in the other end as well. Right, topics for discussion. Well, what can I, what, what, what's uh, what's current at the moment? Well, I've got a couple of things to talk about. One is uh, hobby related or games related, and that's Adeptus Titanicus, the soon to be released and um, much anticipated, but also uh, well, a a reissue of a classic Games Workshop 1988 game which is also called Adeptus Titanicus, um, being released by Specialist Games on the 18th of August. If you can hear any eating noises in the background, that is the cat, uh, if you're wondering. And then I also thought it'd be interesting just to discuss a, a couple of uh, the upcoming film, not a couple of the upcoming film Meg or The Meg um, which is um, due to appear in cinemas soon which uh, has caught my attention right so having drilled a guide hole I'm now going in with the final width drill and just opening the hole up to the final diameter and as you can see, nice and easy. Easy peasy. Okay, Adeptus Titanicus. So Adeptus Titanicus, the quintessential game of Titanic war engine combat. So a lot of people, well, I suppose, let's start with a little bit of history here. Your perception of Adeptus Titanicus may well depend on when you got into the hobby. Now, I got into the hobby just as Adeptus Titanicus was coming on the scene. As a matter of fact, it was 1988 I got into the hobby, which was the very same year that Adeptus Titanicus was released. And there's definitely a bit of a theme with 30th anniversary stuff going on at the moment. Um, so yeah, 30 years on from Adeptus Titanicus, re-release. Now, so I've always thought of Epic as kind of like in my mind's eye, even when it became Space Marine and you got infantry and tanks and then it became um, the multi-species or multi-race game of Epic, uh, which was very much, uh, you know, mixed armor. You had Titans, tanks, infantry. But it always, for me, in my mind's eye, comes back to that original game of Titans. So um, I got to admit, I was quite pleased to hear that they, they as in specialist games, um, had decided to return back to the roots of Adeptus Titanicus and recreate the game somewhat in the image of the original. Now, things have moved on in many areas in the game since uh, 1988. I mean, the miniature manufacturing technology has changed hugely. Um, but also the perception of Titan combat has changed as well. And Thank you, Cat. No, it has, hasn't it? Um, the the Titan combat is is perceived in quite a different way now, M almost entirely or very much thanks to the efforts of Black Library, uh, with the various novels they've written involving Titan combat. And I, well, I know from speaking with the Forge Wall people at Open Day events that the new Adeptus Titanicus is let's call it a game version of that sort of a fictional theme of the style of combat of titans so so i guess that then feeds into the design decision they've made around this game of what scale to put it at 
and they've changed it from the uh, approximately 5.4 millimeter scale or one to three hundredth of the original although the scaling on the original game was haphazard and anyone who has the original dreadnoughts and land raiders and plastic infantry will appreciate this however um, they've in, they've changed the scale they've uh, increase the scale so they've gone from 5.4 to 8 millimeter or well, six some people call it six millimeter it's not really six millimeter it's 5.4 I think yeah so they've gone to a different scaling for the new epic or the new Adeptus Titanicus 8 millimeter and that means the models are noticeably larger as well right hmm. feels like something's happening with this one now nearly there I think Oh, a little bit might need to just tighten the chuck. Now, as you start to go deeper, then you'll probably find that you need to uh, work a bit of material out and then maybe just work without actually drilling in, just work back and forth the drill just to open up the sides a bit. Ah, if we look there, you can see, oops, uh, it's about to make its appearance. There we go. Are we straight? Not bad. Straight enough. If there's more background noises, we now have hamsters. And there we go. All the way through. Let's test the fit. Lovely. Perfect. First bit done. Right. So that was like a nice little intro bit. It's maybe a touch off center on one side, but that won't matter uh, when I come to do the final thing. Uh, I'll be able to realign that bit of the pin to get it right. But yeah, so that piece is now done. I'm now going to, what should we do? Let's have a go at this. Hmm, definitely got hamsters. I'm gonna start drilling this and then I'm gonna edit out the hamster noise. So I'll, I'll catch you in a mo. A guide hole dr drilled there. That's probably sufficient. That's all it needs to do is hold this in place. It doesn't actually need to give it any structural strength, just um, hold it on. So now taking the 2 mil drill, 2.1 mil drill, we can open that up to the final width. Okay, so picking up the thread about Adeptus Titanicus again. So yeah, they've changed the scale, which has provoked a lot of discussion. And the debate so far seems to be quite polarized, I think is the way I would put it. There are people who are very enthusiastic for it. And then there are quite a lot of people who seem dead set against it. Um, I suppose I can see from a point of view of people who used to play Epic that um, a new scale means well the collection that you did have is no longer relevant for this game and there's no compatibility more specifically with the miniatures although rule set wise there's nothing to stop you buying the rules converting the ranges and using uh, the six millimeter model nothing to stop you at all and it will work um, but 
obviously the, yeah you haven't got the compatibility with the new miniatures and the terrain i guess caused one some uh pushback against the design shall we say clearly well there's two reasons why i think games workshop uh well specialist games have gone for eight mil scale firstly is They've come to realise that large models sell better. Um, this is a pretty indisputable fact now. Um, it's pretty unequivocal that that's the case. Yeah, bigger models do sell better. I need to cut this piston down a little bit here, so it doesn't quite fit yet. So we'll uh, we'll do that now. Um, and it's a strategy we've seen. Um, well, let me uh, let me elaborate on that. They do sell better, and I think people, certainly collectors like them. So people who don't game, but they do collect the miniatures, they like the large miniatures, and you can see why. You can, yeah, you can very much see why. But also, it's a clever um, upselling technique, and I think it was... Uh, it was, it was, it was uh, Macro over the Outer Circle who did a video about this, and it's like you were... Uh, you create an impression of giving the customer a larger product and it allows you to charge a bit more for it. Um, so uh, there's an element of that as well, with a new uh, scale as well. I am i don't know if I'm really going to get drawn in on whether or not that's the right thing to do or, you know, should Games Workshop have changed the scale, but, you know, they're a business and their business they got big overheads these days they got them they have to make decent profit margins to justify what they do well and justify themselves to the uh, their investors all right anyway pause that thought i'll do got a little bit of a gap there now that doesn't matter that was nice to fill with a soup song of super glue so there right that's about is that about straight I think so, yeah. I'm looking at it with my eyes and I'm looking at it through the camera. And looking at it with my eyes, it's, I'm sure it's straight. Through the camera, it seems to look a little bit curved, but rest assured, it isn't. Right, let's uh, move forward with the weapon and have a go at this bad boy. Or why don't we call it a bad girl? Yeah, I'm going to call it a bad girl for a change. Why is, it, why is it always the boys who get to be bad? Right, so the scale has clearly um, caused ructions or caused some ripples. Um, in itself and I suppose there's two things there there's firstly as I say the people who had um, have not had but have epic scale from the years gone by but also people who are potentially interested in the new game and its pricing point so bigger miniatures mean higher costs and if we take the launch models the Warlord Titan uh, UK retail, it is £65. So, you know, to sort of put that in perspective, that is a cost that sits somewhere between the, say, Tau Battle Suit and a Knight. It's, it's about in the middle, yeah, if we uh, ignore discounts available on those models in certain situations. So, yeah, it's a more expensive model. It's, you know, it, it's sized proportionately and the kit complexity is probably the same but it is a bit more expensive or it is more expensive quite a bit more expensive than a, a six mil warlord would have been this coupled with the fact that they're launching with the warlord which it, you know in in terms of the range it's the most expensive model so they're launching with the most expensive model now commercially that makes sense but it's less friendly to gamers on a lower budget and they and the fact that they've also produced the Grand Master Edition game, priced at 175 pounds retail in the UK, the most expensive uh, game ever, box game ever done by Games Workshop. Not obviously the Army Bundle, but certainly the most expensive war game they've ever done. That's people feel priced out of that product now. There's a there's a clever bit of marketing at work here, and. I, I suppose I have to hold my hands up of being a a bit guilty of falling <laughs> falling victim to this because uh, I mean I'm fortunate enough to be able to 
um, well, I'm, I'm buying it with a mate, but it's still like going to cost us about seventy pounds each. But I'm fortunate enough to be in a position to buy and share a copy of the Grandmaster uh, edition of Adeptus Titanicus. So, yeah, that's, that's you know that's good. But I appreciate that not everyone maybe has seventy pounds to spend on their hobby, and certainly if you're buying the whole thing, you know, hundred forty pounds sort of UK independent discount or even more than that if you're um just uh buying it retail from games workshop then it, that's a lot more money isn't it so yeah the the product choices at launch are clearly something that has uh certainly caused a bit of a pushback from certain people in the uh you know certain gamers i uh, i mean i don't know i think it depends what you like i mean I, I see loads of people getting hyped for Kill Team, etc. And to be quite honest, I'm more bothered with Games Workshop and how they've represented Kill Team. Kill Team was supposed to be, in my, last time I checked, Kill Team was supposed to be the cheap and uh, or lower cost entry point into Warhammer 40,000. And now it's been rejigged into a full price game. So retail price on uh, the full Kill Team, I think, is £80. And that's very different to what we had in 7th. Now, is that a bad thing? Well, if you like Kill Team, not at all. And with the way that Eighth has restructured 40k, we can see that games change now. Because in Eighth with 40k, 40k is now designed for cheap entry, whereas before it was the exact opposite. It was very expensive to get into. You know, they've shifted the paradigm with Kill Team, and if people are happy with that, you know, you know, good for them. And, and you know, and I, and I say enjoy those games. So perhaps, well, not perhaps. I'm I'm fairly certain that for certain for some people, the fact that they are launching with the warlords. Obviously, you've got the knights as well, who are but knights are a supporting unit. They're not a main unit. Some people aren't happy with that. We have seen pictures of the reaver, and just yesterday I got first wind of a picture of one of the plastic warhounds. Now, plastic warhounds look brilliant. When they come along, I think lots of people are going to going to hop in because. Um, they'll be a lot cheaper and well let's be honest warhounds are cute and people buy it just just to have a warhound who wouldn't buy it for a reaver and wouldn't buy it for a warlord i guess i look at people who aren't happy with the warlords at law at launch and i think well yeah there's a pragmatic view to take there to say well yeah give it two months three months the warhounds come along and you'll be able to get into the game for a much lower cost so, hmm, interesting though. This is coming along nicely. It's a good thing I can waffle a lot, isn't it? So it's taking a, a while to drill through. I've got lots of waffle about um, Adeptus Titanicus. But, I mean, every game for everyone's hobby is a kind of personal choice and, you know, you... you we can all make our own decisions as to what we'd like to spend money on. And none of us can expect that every product will be aimed at or even priced in a way that we can afford it. I mean, okay, yeah, I'm, I, you know, I hold my hands up and, you know, anyone who watches the challenge knows that I'm fortunate to have um, uh, a lot, of, what I think is fair to say, a lot of money to spend on my hobby. But, you know, nonetheless, uh, it, it, it still doesn't devalue the fact that the point is correct. That is the situation, you know. There, there are some products that are aimed at people with more to spend. It's just how it goes. So I'm, I'm, I don't know. I'm hoping that once, once Adeptus Titanicus gets out there and we're a couple of months down the line and some of these cheaper entry units are available, um, I think um, I think some people will probably warm to it who have been put off by the initial approach. I myself... Um, I'm very excited for the game. I think it's it looks really good. I've I've spoken with the game designers. I understand the philosophy and I like the fiction that they're trying to create as a game. Um, I'm a big fan of the Black Library novels and I think with Adeptus Titanicus, a new version, there's a lot of detail and a lot of um, character to each unit in the game. And 
they're trying to capture the idea of these titans being well just that titanic incredible war machines that are they're robotic but there's you know they're they're kind of also a little bit mystical as well something arcane about these in terrifying war machines so i do like that i really do right i think we must right let's see i've been going at this from both ends for quite a while now so that's there and that's there so i think um should have about met now oh there you go yep there you go can you hear that crunching sound going through yeah so let me um there's a lot of detritus in let me uh just clear that not quite yet I mean I can tell it's gone through there's just um some some stuff still in there blocking it through so I'll see if I can extend this drill out a touch that might help clear it A lot of stuff just dropped out then. I can blow through it. Oh, 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 there you go. There we are. It's like the it's like the channel tunnel when the two holes, one from Britain or England, met the one from France. What a, what, yeah, what a great moment in the history of hobbying. I think I might have just overhyped it there. Yeah, and I've filled it with junk again. So we've got the 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 guide hole through there. Yep. Now I can expand it up to the full size one with this drill. So I suppose you know, Adeptus Titanicus. There have been missteps on Games Workshop's part, or, or Forge World Specialist Games' part. The whole. The whole thing with pricing was just absolute nonsense. Um, or not pricing was nonsense. The, their inability to disclose the price for the various products, um, and particularly after at the Forge World Open Day, Andy Hall told a whole bunch of us. Um, he said it to our faces, and we didn't even ask him. He, he volunteered the information that the prices were going to be in the um, August White Dwarf, and then lo and behold, they weren't. It just didn't look good, and it's just like, well, what's going on here? And then what happens a few days later? Um, they get leaked, which isn't actually a leak. It's just that's that's rubbish. It's a fake leak. Um, basically, they've let third-party sellers tell the community what the price is, and it's like, well, have you not got the do you not have the confidence in your own product to tell us Games Workshop and Specialist Games? Can't you just tell us what the cost is? Why won't you do that? That was a that was a an error of judgment in my mind. And I think um, Specialist Games would do well to reflect on that in the future. Anyhow. Before anyone writes a comment, um, I'm not. I, 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 it's kind of completely out of context for this. Or oh, the cat's back. Be right back. Oops. Um, to try comment on the international pricing because people overseas are getting stung by Games Workshop's conversion rate policy on pricing and. Uh, all I can say is I don't like what they're doing and it just doesn't seem right. It seems like they're even accounting for everything and giving Games Workshop the benefit of the doubt on certain areas of pricing. It still seems like there's 20 to 25% say for the US on the UK price and then the situation if you're in Australia or New Zealand is well, it's, it's just out of control, uh, completely out of control. So. Yeah. Oh, gosh, that sounded like a bit of a rant then, didn't it? Didn't mean to. Right. So, 
Uh, I saw a bit of daylight there, little glimmers. Right, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to go in with this wire now and try push any material that's still in that channel through. Oh, something moved quite a bit then. Better take the other bits off. This is quite a snug fit, to put it mildly. Um, it's quite a tight fit, so oh, heard that move. So it's no surprise there's a bit of a, a bit of wrestling going on here. Just need to be careful as well. If you're doing this and you've gone all the way through, you've got a piece of wire, sharp wire, sharp ends. Do make sure that you keep the end clear of your fingers because if that goes through, it will go straight into your finger and it won't be a nice injury either. Um, so yeah, do be careful with that if you're doing this. There you go, that looks pretty good now, doesn't it? Now, I suppose if we just part the Adeptus Titanicus discussion again a bit. Um, I'm not. I suppose I'm not exactly explaining how I'm doing this with aligning the. Um, there we go. Through she goes. Aligning the drill holes and well, I am doing it. Is I'm using the geometry at this end, so getting it central. So thinking about how. Uh, you know, the hole needs to go central and the lower recess. And then using this section of the uh, lance as a guide, a visual guide to go through. And also, as you saw, just, you know, constantly checking my orientation as I'm drilling through. And, you know, as I've just done here, in about 20 minutes of work, maybe a bit less on this, we've bored this through completely. Oops. There we go. I think I'm getting a, a little bit of resistance there because um, of the sharp end. There we go, it keeps snagging, but I'm pretty happy with that now. And so on this, this is forward on the lance. So uh, I don't know how you, uh, let's say the heraldry points forward. So as my friend wants to assemble it, we then need to slide the uh, that section on there, and then the tip on there. You can see how that already is all nicely lining up. Right, now it's time for the hardest piece. This is hardest because it is the longest. Exactly the same drill, it's just this time we're going to be drilling in further. And it's a narrow piece as well, so unlike this fella here, there's not much room for error. So you can you can also see another subtle hint here is I started with easy part and I worked my way up in difficulty. And even for me, who you know got a lot of experience of doing this, I've I've just built it up, got my eye in, you know, got into the swing of using the tool before attempting the hardest uh, part. But I'm ready to do that now. One important thing to do with this piece: make sure it is straight before you start work. Um, this was bent, so I heat straightened it out. It's really important to get it straight before you start work. Uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think that's probably it on Adeptus Titanicus. Um, I will be getting the Grandmaster Edition, as I say, buying it with a friend. I'm really excited for the game. Um, I like how, it, as I said, I like the conceptual side of it, and I like the miniatures. They've done a really good job with the miniatures, and. Although it delayed them a year, I think in the long run, they probably made the correct decision with moving away from resin um, resin miniatures for this game. I did have my reservations about them doing it in resin, um, just from a sheer point of the cost and, well, we can already imagine it, can't we? If they'd done this game in resin, this Grandmaster, Manster, <laughs> Grandmaster edition would have probably cost. Uh, let me try work it out. I reckon somewhere between two hundred and twenty-five and two hundred and fifty pounds. Uh, even apply the same sort of discounting as they have done um, here, it would have still cost that. And 
that would have put it, I think, psychologically, if not in reality, out of reach for an awful lot of people. Very high risk going for such a high cost product for a for game for well for a game as an intro as a starting game. I mean Forge will sell. <laughs> Routinely sell every day loads of kits that are that sort of price, but it's a bit different when it's a game. Anyway, I'm looking forward to it and needless to say there will be channel content around it. So keep an eye out for that. Now let's change our topic and move on to film. It's been a while since I've chatted to you guys and girls about film and it's quite an opportune moment actually because um, there's a film that's about to really be released in a few days time that I'm very interested to go see and this is The Meg. So. What is the Meg? If you've uh, not had an opportunity to catch any of the information around it, well, the Meg is essentially it is a scary monster film, and the antagonist or the creature is a megalodon. So the megalodon is an extinct type of shark that is well known from its um, frequently preserved and enormous teeth. Um, it's a very interesting creature. Lots of people imagine it as a huge great white shark. Uh, so, uh, uh, char uh, Caracodon Charis or Cararis, I just can't, I just forget the Latin name of a great white shark now. Um, although the latest, um, I think the latest taxonomic and cladistic work around the animal suggests it was actually quite a different group uh, and not uh, a direct uh, not from a direct, would it be genus, uh, as a great white shark, so like uh, your mackerel sharks. So mackerel sharks include things like uh, the great white shark, uh, the thresher shark, not the thresher shark, sorry, the mako shark, and for people who live around UK waters, um, the poor beagle shark, which is, um, you know, essentially like a mini great white, and certainly shares a lot of its uh, sophisticated evolutionary developments. Anyway, Coming back to Megalodon and the Meg, thanks to some, well, infamy and famous uh, and fame, uh, the Megalodon has become something of a pop culture icon, uh, mainly around um, the the so-called Shark Week science program that um, the Discovery Channel uh, programs that Discovery Channel ran, which became well over time sort of moved away from uh, their truth. Then there's a they ran one a few years back. I just forget the year. Was it 2009? And it was it was fiction, but they presented it as fact, and uh, it portrayed an encounter with the megalodon, which was utter false, uh, utterly false, uh, as a real event. Megalodon has been extinct for a, a long, long time. A long, 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 long time. If you care to read the science around it, if it wasn't extinct. Uh, an enormous predator like that, we would have seen a long ago. So the Meg. Yeah. It looks interesting because it takes, I'm interested as to how much of a rerun of the Jaws film it will be. And I'm hoping it won't be um, because the Jaws film, while, um, well, the, the novel was making a very subtle and true point about um, how, was it Peter Blatchley? I think it was Peter Blatchley who was the author. He used the great white shark in Jaw as an, an avatar for nature striking back against humans from a point of view of um, trying to raise people's awareness about environmental issues and, and saying how and recognizing how humans are um, a, an extremely dominant force in nature and the idea that nature won't always sit back and allow us to dominate. The problem was Spielberg in the film of the same name and very very famous film and an excellent film I love Jaws but Spielberg completely took that nuance element out of a shark and it very much changed the way the story played out it played out well unfortunately well it created a load of shark phobia didn't it and uh, well I've seen all sorts of numbers 
it's generally recognised that the um, aftermath of Jaws has been highly negative to populations of sharks in the wild, which is a serious issue because sharks are um, fulfil a, a very important ecological role at the top of the food chain, as many of them are. I mean, many of them are uh, apex or near apex predators. So that's why the Meg interests me um, on a sort of a mm, uh, what the film is going to be like. I mean, I think the Megalodon's great. Uh, I suppose you could say it's a bit like Jurassic Park in the water. Is it going to be like that and be a bit tongue-in-cheek? I, I hope it's actually really tongue-in-cheek rather than taking the much more gritty and realistic slant of Spielberg's Jaws film. So, yeah, I'm going to go see The Meg. I'm interested to see how it plays out. I mean, I, I think I don't think they'll go quite crazy with uh, with the shark. I, I don't think it'll be outright outlandish um, as Sharknado was. I think they're, they're going to go for something a bit <laughs> a bit more mainstream and serious. But as I say, yeah, likewise, I hope it's not. I, I I hope the megalodon is a bit co comic, really, and they don't make a make it something that is too much like real world shark and and has a potential to um well cause another wave of shark phobia it's the meg interested to hear what you guys and girls think about the meg in the comments i do have a soft spot for slightly daft films like that uh what else i mean there's another Hardcore Henry, if you've ever seen Hardcore Henry, Henry, which I've talked about briefly before, is another slightly crazy film in that regard. So how are we doing with our challenge bit? So we've got to here. So that's probably 30% of the way, well, maybe a third on one side. So I think I need to do some work on this side now, which I've been avoiding. I need to progress this one a bit. It's starting to starting to make some progress here. Hmm. Okay, so I made a little I've got a bit of an error there, so I've my angle's a little bit like this. I need to do something to reposition the angle of that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to drop down to a smaller diameter drill bit and use that to change direction. And so that's what I was working with before. And that's what I'm just going to briefly change to now. What this basically allows me to do is it gives me some room in the hole to change the orientation uh, as I'm going. So I'm, I'm a bit off, uh, a bit off center. It's going a bit. Uh, if I kept that going, the if I kept going in that direction, it's going to end up in the wrong place. One thing um, I'll be fascinated to hear is how other people have attempted um, to reinforce such a part as this. If you, you know, if you've done it yourself, or if you know of anyone else who does it, and they've got a particular style that's uh, different to this, I'll be really interested to hear how you go about doing this. It's not, it's not exactly the, what you would what you would call the most immediately obvious thing to have a solution for I mean the the real solution with models like this where you've got long thin resin parts that bear weight is to actually manufacture them with a steel support well, I say steel but let's say an integral wire support 
Um, and that's certainly what, um, I just forget the firm now, but there's a firm that makes um, very, uh, very sort of like high spec um, aircraft kits in resin. But there's a, those are quite thin in places, but what they do is they actually put the supports in when they cast it. So, you know, they would have cast it with, you know, a piece of wire in it to reinforce it, but um, not forge all. In all fairness to forge world, uh, forge world, if you can say, I don't know if that would really work on something like this either. Right, how are we doing here? Right, I'm happier with the orientation on that now. I think I'm about back on track. Um, so I'm just gonna, I'm gonna continue a bit further with this thinner drill. So I'm making, I think I'm making better progress than I was with that thicker one. Um, yeah. that one as is. Right, let's go back to the wider drill. Whoops. And we'll continue with this one. Now, this is quite a lot to do in one sitting. I've got to admit, uh, my, my hands are getting a little bit on the tired side, so obviously I'm going to do this because I want to demonstrate the whole thing to you in one go, but if you're doing this yourself, you know, you don't need to do it all in one go. You could break it up a bit. Right, so let's just be careful here to make sure that as I widen this hole, uh, we stay on track with the corrected orientation using the thinner drill. How far in are we now? Well, I've still got a fair way to go. Right, let's see if we can make a bit more progress. I think I have a suspicion that the progress is slowing. Um, probably because it's getting harder to get material back up the drill as we go deeper. So we now need to start applying a bit more force. I can do that now because we've got a nice long channel that is guiding uh, the drill bit, but still, it's you know you need to be careful. Keep checking, just keep checking your orientations all the time. That's a funny noise. Done a bit more. Let's let's see how much progress we've got now. So we, that's pretty good there. We're about almost halfway there. And on this side, we are a way to go. So there's about that much left to go. I'm, I think I'm going to change to the smaller drill again. So it's uh, now we're deeper in. I'm finding the going with that thick drill quite slow. So. I think it will be beneficial to do some work with this thinner one now. Clearly, I've got to be careful to get my initial alignment right to avoid tears later on. It should now be possible to drill in somewhat quicker again.
It's going to be a long video, this one. An hour and three. Wow. I'm not going to edit this much. So if there's gulps, uh, coughs, and other bodily noises, uh, I do apologize. But um, I'm not going to have time to do a, a full on edit uh, to this as I would normally do. But um, I'm hoping you enjoy it nonetheless. I've got some really cool stuff coming to feature on the channel soon. And, and fans of Retro Hammer, which I've not been able to uh, devote time to, certainly to do it in the quality that ma that I want to present to, to you all. Um, I've not been able to do that f recently due to various um, things that are going on in life in general. So, um, but I can tell you that, I mean, there will be more Retro Hammer, don't you worry. I've got a real treat in store for everybody um, shortly. Uh, I can't, I'm not going to say what it is, so I don't want to spoil the surprise, but um, it, you will love it, believe me. You'll absolutely love it. There we go. I think we are nearly through. So back to the bigger drill. I felt something go then. Um, I think we might have got uh, got might have made contact on the other side. That really worked. That um, flicking back to that thinner drill then that really uh, it was really useful. That ooh oh dear, I was worried about that. Right, I have to see the little bulge. I've just gone a little bit out, so I have to just. Okay, let's see if we can guide it back again. It gets a bit trickier, but mm. let's see if I can. I'm sure I can. I haven't got much choice. I have to get it right, don't I? That little bulge there from the from the drill bit. There's a couple of ways I can put that right. Either heat bend it back into place later, or if I get a little bit of penetration there with the drill, I'll just fill it, uh, and it won't matter. Not as much as uh, avoiding the droopy barrel will. Right. Let me get a thin piece of wire to uh, test the way. All right, so a thinner piece of wire here. Maybe not quite through yet. Let me try the other side. If I get some pliers. Press it through. Something went through. Let's get a slightly thicker bit, thinner piece of wire. Whoops. Right, let's try this one. Mm, not quite. Back to the drill. One thing with doing this, you wouldn't want to use too thin a drill because if it if it snapped while you were going through, then uh, you'll have a right job getting it out. Right, so that in that side, and that in that side, that to me looks like halfway. So let's see if we can uh, get this piece. Of, there we go. Through. Right. That's the first half of a challenge done. Now we uh, need to just expand the hole a bit more. Now this is a bit where I'm a little bit worried it might go horribly wrong. So uh, wish me luck. It's easy for me to say when I'm doing this with someone else's model, isn't it? Gosh, how blase can you be? Anyway, we see what happens. Just get a little bit of hole guidance. Always room to change 
the way the hole's going just a little bit just a little bit you can always do it as you as you work your work your um bore as you change it Now at this stage, you probably just want to also be, just be a little bit careful. You don't want to snap your piece either. That wouldn't be good because having bored it out, it's obviously lost some uh, structural strength as a consequence. Oh, right. And there, there you go. You can see the pink of my fingers, we are through. Wow. Back to the medium sized drill. Trying to. widen the contact point which I think has been successful I can feel um, how much strength this has lost now through boring it out. It's kind of like it's a, you've got to get weak to get strong thing. So do you need to be more careful at this stage? Hopefully we will triumph. Triumph. So I'm going to pull it back a little bit. I'm just going to work the neck here a little bit. Whoa. Nice little collection of resin shavings there, look at that. All the way, there you go. Wow. Now, you can see some of the ribs have got slightly raised. Don't worry about that if that happens. I will push those back in with heat once this is finished. I'll heat it up once it's all glued and then I'll uh, get a chisel and I'll just push them back. and It'll be okay. Right, so let's see how far we've gone this side. So, that's all the way that side. So, right. Let's just um, all this squeaking is there's so much contact now on the drill bit. So we've gone that far in. So we don't need to go all the way from the other side, do we? It'd be funny if I get to the end of this video and find out the audio hasn't worked. That would be um, amusing for all the wrong reasons. Well, you guys could laugh at me, you guys and girls, but um, I might just have to go and have a little cry. Maybe I could just put some relaxing piano music to it instead. Yeah, maybe that'll work. All right, let's, um, let's run that thinner piece of wire through again. Over drill. Yep, we're getting there. We are winning. Uh, 
now definitely winning. Right, so I've run out of conversation topics because this took longer than I thought and waffling about Adeptus Titanicus and Meg hasn't uh, seen me that far. So what shall I talk about? Uh, film or games? Uh, as usual, I've got more projects on the go than I can uh, ever seem to get to. Um, I've completed the build of Anacharis Scaria of the Mechanicum. So I need to get a review for him posted uh, soon. Hopefully, it's Thursday today, isn't it? So maybe I might get to that Friday, and if not Friday, Saturday. So I want to, I do want to do that before this week's out. There we go. And we're in. Nice little pop, nice little um, whoop, sound there. Right, I'm going to get my, just going to get my file. I'm just going to take the burrs off the edge of this so it will fit the channel a bit better. So it's going to be a snug fit this. Oops, right, so it wants to go that way. We have got all the way through now. Oh, super duper, look at that. Get everything lined up. There you have it. A little bit, a little bit of bending at this end just to lift that up, but Yeah, I'm pretty pleased with that. Now, yeah, got to get this off. I think now we want to run this piece of wire through here a couple of times, just to uh, just to work that channel. It's a definite little step in there, I think, from when I changed direction goes to show. But despite the long length and uh, the hefty piece of wire we're using, we haven't got any haven't got any penetrations at the sides. Maybe just a little bit of a wobble on the alignment there. You can see. If we can, um, let's let's go back in with the drill and see if we can just uh, work open this channel a bit more. I reckon we can. Ooh. Tell you, this has been a bit of a challenge, this one. But I've got to admit, I've rather enjoyed doing this. Um, I'm very pleased with the result. It's always a bit of a um, bit of unknown. My mate was very brave lending me uh, this to work on. <laughs> Either he's got more faith, he's got he's got a lot of faith in my skills, or. Uh, Something equivalent. Let's have a look. Are we happy with that? You can see there's a little bit of a wobbly dobbly along, which is caused by basically where I haven't got the channel 100% level all the way through. Does that matter? No, because I've got an idea how I can sort that out just by heating up a bit, bending the resin a bit here and there, a little bit of sanding, and then I think it'll be okay. Yeah, I think it'll be fine. And put it this way, it'll certainly be. Far better than um, having a droopy barrel six months down the line. So I'm just putting this thick wire through a few times. Each time it does that, I can feel I can feel it rubbing and the burrs, and that's that, that's kind of opening the channel up a bit further, and it's uh, improving the fit, and maybe even running down some of those inconsistencies in the channel which are causing that slight uh, wobbliness right now we're really making progress there you go see look at that that's uh, that's really knocked out all the gunk and junk ah there look at that you can see how much straighter that is now nice right let's just uh, 
work that a little bit more. And then we are probably into the final phase of this uh, piece of work. Because then all the, we've just got two tasks left to do now. And the remaining two tasks are to, what are they to do? To drill the head and then just to cut the wire to the correct length. Anyway, so let's just to finish this bit. Happy with that. It also shows just how forgiving a medium the resin is. Um, you know, so we've gone from an extremely tight fit with a bit of inconsistency in the channel to a nice smooth channel and a really straight piece. Right. So now we just need to do this bit here like that. So exactly the same drill. This should be nice and straightforward. This is just like the little, yeah, this is like the little coasting home. Put a um, guide hole in and then we'll start with a thin drill. And we'll get that, get that started. if there's any noise there's some TV going on somewhere but um, just ignore them All right let's concentrate on the uh, on the drill now how far in is that nearly enough we'll go a little bit further it um, it doesn't need to go that far into the head I mean all this is doing is this is just holding it in place it's not uh, the head needs no structural support it's not like the haft that's all it's doing for this so going to the bigger board drill and widening the hole up. Just like so. Let's see that goes in so far. Yeah. With that uh, big two mil two mil thick wire that will do fine right happy with that now let's assemble this and work out uh, what we're working out assemble this and work out just how long we need to cut this wire to just gonna, um, let's just do a little bit of deburring on this end now the burrs have served their purpose, opening that channel through. So, there we go. Uh, I, I'm going to cut that off about here. So this will now take a little bit of um, Evie Ho work. Which I'm going to do off camera some, as I said, these wire cutters, while they're strong enough to cut the wire, they're not designed for such thick wire. So what's normally a one-handed tool is requiring two hands, but it will get there and it won't damage the cutters either. There we go, and I've actually just snapped the end off. Oops. All right, let's just drill that in a little bit further rather than go through the rigmarole of cutting the wire a bit shorter. Not necessary. We're happy. Perfect. And there you have it. There's a bit more, a little bit of work to do just with a little touch here and there just to get it dead straight. Um, but that, that is pretty much it. Um, I'm, yeah. Very, very pleased with that. So that's worked really well. And what we've got now is we've got this wonderful weapon for the 
Serastus Knight Lancer, which you know everybody loves, and it's a great design, but we've eliminated the problem of the drooping head uh, because of this thin haft. And what instead we've got is we've got a weapon that now, when my friend assembles his Knight Serastus, he can put this in any orientation and it will not distort due to the, the force of gravity over time. Or even if it's a, you know, it gets very hot, it could also start to move. Yeah, very good. And just to uh, show you again, in case, you know, it, it all seems like magic. Let's go back again. Uh, there's our wire, there's the end. We have a short haft going on first. We've got the um, the arm mount. We've got the long haft. And then finally, we've got the head of the lance attaching up front. So I hope you've enjoyed this demo. Uh, it's been a long one. You know, <laughs> nearly uh, what well, we to nearly an hour and a half. Um, I do hope you've enjoyed watching it, and I hope you found it an interesting and useful demonstration, just to show how uh, you can reinforce a resin, a delicate resin part like this. Uh, also, though, doing it with relatively simple and certainly cheap tools. Please do share your thoughts and observations down in the comments. Um, interested to hear those. I hope you enjoyed the film and the game chat as well, even if I did ramble a lot. But other than that, I would just like to say thank you very much for watching. I'll speak to you next time, and goodbye. Time for some magic. Pile of hearts. that will never droop.